<laughs> hey everybody. Crystal, good to see you. Please lead us. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your teaching. Father, strengthen us as leaders and ministers to your gospel, Father God. And we just pray right now that you bless Denise. Help to give her calmness of spirit, Father God, as she stands before us and speaks tonight, Lord. Give her confidence. Give her joy in her heart, Lord. Thank you for bringing such amazing women to come and speak to us tonight, Lord. And bless our ears, Lord, to hear what we need to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 All right. All right. Let's just uh, let's review the questions. Scripture from chapter five is John fourteen twelve. Most assuredly, I say to you, I'll turn it down. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. Yeah. Only purpose of that is to make it hit the uh, the video camera. Oh. So. That's what's so, because I figure that we here in this classroom can hear anything that's said from up here with or without a microphone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes that thing doesn't pick it up. Okay. All right, uh, let's go, uh, Gail. Jesus saw potential in unlikely people. Give three examples and support these with scripture. You don't have your paper? No. Uh, is it here? No. Oh, because you turned the paper in. Okay. Yeah, last year. Yeah, a year ago. <laughs> Two years ago. Three years ago. Just read it off of Lizzie's. I'll read it off of Patty's. How that? Yeah. Okay. Do what Patty said. Wrong one. <laughs> See what Patty said. Three examples of Jesus' um, attention unlikely people. The tax collector, Luke 5, 27 at 30 to 32. Uh, despised woman, John 4, 5 through 18. And so me, woman of the well. me, because I believe in them, in him, John 14, 12. Powerful surprise ending. Good. Uh -huh. okay. She went a little beyond All right. it. Um, let's go, uh, Crystal. Number three, list five keys for releasing your potential and explain why each one is important. Um, thinking, uh, thinking we must renew our minds by the word and believe in the new person that we are becoming as we are transformed by the power of God. Um, embracing God's correction. God corrects those he loves and um, will be corrected by surrender or through the fire. Um, becoming a worker approved by God, being consistent and building a foundation on our faith, um, being active in the local church, serving and becoming part of the team, surrounding ourselves with people who are doing um, well and succeeding, um, the company we have, um, Affects our character. Excellent. Good job. All right. Number four, we'll go to Tammy. What should every church member be and why? Every member should be a minister. We all need to be involved in the ministry to open our gifts, abilities, talents, and anointings to grow the church and strengthen it. Excellent. I'm sorry, we were a lot of questions there. Right? Am I? We are. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me just hand it over to the amazing Denise no. Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I'm just going to get right to it. Um, so it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Um, I thought the scripture was important um, because it was important to point out that Jesus was not concerned with anyone outperforming him. 
for outdoing him. In fact, he encourages us to do more and allows us to do so at our own will. He does not need to control us, but rather we submit and yield out of our love for him and turn and in turn follow him. Um, Jesus had the ability to recognize the untapped potential, potential within people. Um, he looked beyond the surface of what he could see with his natural eyes. And if someone wants to turn to Matthew 4, 18 through 22, we'll just read, read that. Anybody? I should have read that. Through 22. Okay, Chapter 4. Yeah, go ahead. Um, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two, bro two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. Called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. All right, and um, I chose that scripture because we see there that you know you just see you know men fishing or you know doing what they what they do you know and a lot of times we identify people by what they do their occupation but Jesus was able to see that um, that he would eventually disciple them and they would become, you know, his closest friends and apostles that carried the gospel um, very far. So um, during that time, um, even the most difficult people became valuable leaders under Jesus' guidance. And we too have the same potential. We can choose to follow him just as Peter and Andrew did. Now, why y'all have? There's hope. There's hope. Oh, no. There is hope. She's the most and people. I and I think we all can say that about ourselves. You know, um, we all have like our own rap sheet. We can all say we got our list of things. It's like, man, I already know when you're dealing with me, what you gonna get, and like, you know. And I think of, a lot of times I think about Peter, and I mean, Peter was like all the time. Just I mean, he had it, but. Sometimes he would say stuff and Jesus was like, when Jesus had to rebuke him, because he was like, no, you're not going to the cross. Like, stop that. And Jesus was like, no, Satan, be quiet. Like, you know? So, I mean, even someone like Peter, who was like, I would never deny you. And he then turns around and actually does it. Like, you know, but Jesus still was able to see the potential in him from the very beginning and was able to use him and carry him um, to do mighty works for him. Um, another person um, that I wanted to talk about was the Samaritan woman. Um, so just a few things about her. If we can turn to John chapter 4, 4 through 26. Um, we don't necessarily have to read it all, but some of the things that um, I wanted to point out was the Samaritan woman. Um, she represented the lowest of the low. She was a woman. She was a Samaritan. And um, even when Jesus you know, began to ask her for a drink. She's like, you know, you, you know, you who are a Jew, you have no dealings with the Samaritans. Like, what are you doing asking me for a drink of water? So just kind of looking at the stats, you know, a little bit, it's like, you know, women weren't really considered to be the greatest in society. And then on top of that, she was um, a woman with uh, poor reputation. She was really an outcast, and certain things give us clues to that. Um, as I go to the next point, traditionally and culturally, drawing water was a social event, and it was done usually in the mornings. And we have this woman coming out in the middle of the day by herself. So nine times out of ten, she wasn't socially accepted um, or even culturally accepted. Um, she was most likely an outcast amongst the women and others in the community. And then Jesus, you know, sparks up this conversation with her and he tells her that she has five five husbands and the one she's with now is not even hers. So then we get a little insight as to why her status is what it is. And then um about being a promiscuous woman, her reputation preceded her. Um so you know everybody knew that about this woman and her living situation. 
yet Jesus, you know, saw a need to speak to her. And then not only that, he saw the potential that even someone with her reputation could eventually cause an entire city to come to him um, and be made aware of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So then continuing on, what did he see in this Samaritan woman? Jesus saw potential in her to carry the gospel to an entire city and ultimately play a key part in Jesus' personal mission and ministry and breaking traditions and bringing salvation to anyone who hears and believes. So, you know, the gospel was initially, you know, for the Jews. And then you get, you know, this woman who, and Jesus, as Jesus is, you know, has, has, as Jesus has come in person, like, he's not only just here for the Jews, but he's here to break down those barriers and reach different all religions, races, people, whatever, uh, everyone of every kind. And this was a part of his own personal mi mission and ministry to kind of break that barrier, if you will, or whatever, and not just limit the gospel to, you know, one race or one kind of people or one group of people, but anyone who hears and believes. And this is, you know, a good example of him using her to do that. So it wasn't just about her re him reaching that city, but also breaking down some traditions and different things like that. Um, and then on page 37, I just quoted exactly from the book. I like um, what it said. It said, Jesus saw tremendous potential in a rejected woman of low moral standing and used her to influence an entire city. Great leaders must be able to perceive and draw out the potential which is hidden within a person. Anyone can see the obvious, but it takes a leader to see the potential within. Andrew Carnegie put it this way. When you work with people, it's a lot like mining for gold. You must literally move tons of dirt to find a single ounce of gold. However, you don't look for the dirt. You look for the gold. And the dirt is very obvious. So, um, but I think as leaders, God is calling us to look beyond what we see um, in front or what, or if somebody tells you, okay, well, this person is like this. You know, or this person is like that. Like we have to be able to not necessarily ignore maybe the warning sign or whatever they're, you know, whatever someone has informed you about a person, but also go to Christ and say, hey, what do you see in this person? Because regardless of form or reputation, anybody can be changed at any, at any given point in their life. Um, it's never too late for anybody. And um, when I was reading that paragraph, I thought about this one time we went on like a field trip with all these kids. And there was like, we were mining for gold. I forgot where we went, but we were like mining for gold. And there was like, like these little. Wild West. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And there's like these little, yeah. And it was like these little banks or whatever, if you will, like water and all kinds of stuff in there. And you were just looking for the one that shined, you know, but just a little gold on it. But, um, and that's literally how we have to be when we're dealing with people. And you've got to look past you know, them being difficult or hard to deal with or whatever it may be. So, but that made me think of that. Um, Jesus sees the potential in you. So, even though <laughs> we, start, <laughs> we start off a little bit rough, you know, regardless of that, Jesus does see the potential in each and every one of us. Um, God has created us all with unique purpose and calling. Um, he put it there and he knows how to bring it forward. Um, Dr. Seuss, in honor of Dr. Seuss Week. <laughs> Sorry, I work with kids, so, you know. Um, but he has um, he has a little saying that he says, like, um, of course, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head, but um, there's no one. Oh, shoot, I got to look it up now. Give me like three. It'll just probably pop right up. You probably have heard it. Is it really in honor of Dr. Seuss? It is, yeah. This week is Dr. Seuss week, so Tuesday was... You might not be able to get that without a flag from Google. It's like canceled. Right. I know, they like did away with some books. Um, Tuesday was read, or Monday was read across America Day or something like that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so it says, Today you are you that is truer than true. There is no one alive who is youer than you. And I love that because 
That is literally the way God designed us all to be. There's nobody that can be a better version of you than you. So just be who you are. And um, yeah. Um, so the next point that says is that it may not look like it. And you may not feel like there's more to who you are right now. But your potential was placed inside of you from day one. It is up to us to allow God to release all that he has placed on the inside of us. Similar to the Samaritan woman, we were all at one point an outcast with with nice with a nice rap sheet, but that does not determine our future in Christ. Um, and then some keys to releasing your potential. Um, as Jesus handpicked his disciples and so many others, he had one thing that he said to all of them, and that was, "Follow me." Um, so the question is, will you follow him? And in following, him, there are some things that we need to do. Um, the first one is change our thinking. If someone can read Romans 12 and 3, and then um, let's have, and then somebody can get Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 and so on. Everybody just, you know, keep going. We'll just, we'll just keep it going. And once you get Romans 12 and 3, just read it. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. As God has dealt to each one of us a measure of faith. Okay, and then embracing God's correction. Somebody can read Proverbs 3, 11, and 12. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves, and the Father of the Son in whom he delights. And then Proverbs 10 and 17. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. And I love I I love that um, embracing God's correction because I feel like <clears throat> you know in my walk with Christ there have been like so many times where I felt like like why me like why does it always got to be me like you know like every time something happens. It just feels like, you know, like it's me. Like I'm the one that needs to change. I'm the one that's got to, you know, and I, and I, I used do. to just be so like, <laughs> like, man, this sucks. Like, you know, and so sad about it and all this kind of stuff and feeling like I'm just this horrible person. But then you dive into the word of God and it encourages us to embrace that correction that, that God, he chastens those whom he loves. And that's just him showing his care. And it's just like me as a mother with my kids, you know, it's like, if I don't correct them, then I'm not I'm not doing them any justice. You know, I'm not doing them any favors. So that is um, a way that parents also show their love for their kids is by correction and discipline and keeping them on the right track. So, um, but I feel like my whole life I just felt like, why well, I me? Mean, it's just always me. Like she just get to do whatever. And you just get to do. You know, yeah, that's me all day. So, but yeah. All right, uh, become a worker approved by God, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. I got it. All right. Um, work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Very good. And, and then be active in the work of God with the people of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And um, I like that one because a lot of times we can, like, you know, we'll say, like, you know, we're, we're in church, we go to church and everything like that, but we're not doing life with other believers. You know, we're hanging out with whoever, whatever, I don't, I don't know, our childhood friend that has no interest in Jesus Christ at all. So um, just watching the company that you keep and then being connected and active in the body of Christ. Um, those are all ways that God kind of squeezes out our potential. And those type of situations where it's like iron sharpens iron, where you're rubbing with your brothers and sisters in Christ and you're doing life with other people and allowing God to just change your thinking and um, as you read his word and, and live it out, you know, um, that's how we're going to get to where um, God has called us to be. Um, Can I read one more verse that, of uh, course. on that point? Yeah. It's uh, 2 Timothy 2.22. You, you know, be a leader, you read 2 Timothy a lot. Yeah. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Right. 
Right, I see David a lot. But it says, uh, flee also uh, youthful lusts and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of pure heart. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.22 Yeah, and that's good. It speaks to like doing life with with other believers for sure. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna talk about some hindrances to releasing your potential. Um, busyness without purpose. Ephesians five fifteen through seventeen. If someone wants to get that, and while you get that, I'll just talk a little bit about that because I feel like in this day and time, like a fast paced life, people don't even feel like they're accomplished if they're not moving nonstop or, you know what I mean? Like busy all the time. You're productive, you think you're productive, but you're really just, you know, busy, you know? Like, and busyness without purpose is void, it's just wasted energy and time. So um, I think it's very important that we. Live a purpose driven life. Um, somebody have it? Okay. Uh, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand that the will of the Lord, what the will of the Lord is. Mm -hmm. And I like that, that as well, too, because um, I think in the book, in the chapter, he talked about like basically if you don't purpose your time like life will just fill it with whatever and you'll be yeah. pulled and tugged and called to whatever the day calls you to you know and I, I thought about I don't remember exactly where it is in the bible but I thought about a time where um, I don't remember who it was either but Jesus was they I think the disciples like called him to do something I don't remember what it was and then he was like well, no, I, I need to go here, like, to do with the world, Father, or something like that. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Help me out. But I just it just made me think about that. Like, like uh, maybe it's John 11. John 11, let me see. Yeah, I'm reading it. Yeah. Um, that's fine. I might find it during the break. But okay, all right. And then the next one is apathy and lethargy. If anybody has that. Um, First Chronicles 16:11. Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face evermore. Okay, and then Acts 16:9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. That was 16? Yeah. What's 10? Okay, yeah, so I have to read 10 and about this. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia including that the Lord had called us to preach in the gospel to them. So immediately is the key part there. Um, not being um, lethargic or just, you know, <coughs> lax, so to, you know, so to speak, like like the days ago, dragging your feet. Um, and then Acts 18 and 9. 18 and 9? Mm-hmm. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid. 
speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in your city belong to me. Amen. And then verse 11, it says, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So that kind of finishes that thought. All right. Um, fear is another thing that will hinder you from releasing your potential. So I'm going to read First John 4 and 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. <clears throat> this is like a, a, a personal thing for me. I've dealt, I've had a lot of friends or close friends that have dealt with fear um, and anxiety, which is a big fear. Um, but it's definitely from doing so many things. And my mom being one of them, like, anything she sees on the news, like, somebody died in a, for example, we were going to do a hot air balloon ride. And, like, I was trying to get together, like, six people so we could minimize the cost. And my mom was one of them. And I'm like, okay, mom, like, we're going. This is the day. It's how much you need. And then, like, I think, like, the next day or something, like, next couple of days on the news, there were some people who went on a hot air balloon ride and the company was janky or something and people died. Like they hit power line or something and died. And it was all over the news. My mom, I'm not going, I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't know, people dying. I'm like, really? People died from like driving in their car, Safer like the walking on the sidewalk. <laughs> like you're kidding me. I'm like, for real though. <laughs> Needless to say, we ended up not going. I mean, I eventually went at a different time, but. But yeah, like, you know, fear is just, it is my personal motto when it comes to fear is if your reason not to do something or your reason to do something is fear, then do the opposite. <laughs> just, I used to um, follow Joyce Meyer when I went to her conferences and like one year she did this whole thing on Do It Afraid. Yeah. And I just, I just love that concept, like. You know, mm -hmm. but anyway. All right. And then weak relational skills. And I'm just going to read straight out of um, page 41. And it says the platform for success is favor. Jesus grew in favor with God and man. Um, Luke 252. Favor becomes your platform to minister. The strength of your ministry is found in the strength of your relationship with people. All ministries should be a flow of relationships. If, you, if they receive you, they'll get your reward. The closer and stronger the relationship, the more real you are. In ministry, you're always going to have relational challenges. Sometimes people will like you as long as you can benefit them. But once you can no longer benefit them, they will just drop you. That's why Jesus said, follow me and I will make you. It was in relationship that they had with, with him that they were being made. It wasn't just listening to him, but it was listening and learning from him. You know, I thought that was just perfectly said. It was very well said. Um, and then I added one, get out of your own way. Because <laughs> a lot of times it's just us. Like, you know, we got to, everything's got to make sense to us. Everything's got to, you know, we got to throw in our two cents. Well, how does this feel and all this? But um, Proverbs 3 and 5 says, um, trust in the Lord. In all of your ways. I don't know. I forgot. With all your heart. With all your heart. I'm like drawing a blank. Trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. Lean not into not your own understanding, you know, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Yeah. That's right. I'm like, I know, I know it. I'm drawing a blank because I'm up here to talk it. But, um, but yeah, get out of your own way. Lean into the Lord. You know, don't lean so much on yourself, your, your knowledge, your logic and all that. But really lean into the Lord and allow him to direct your path. Um, I would say maybe a couple of years ago, I just literally stopped thinking so much and just was like, okay, God, like I'm going to move and we're going to do this. You know, I'm just trust you in this. And he's ever since I made that choice, like it's just been one thing after another. I've just seen things just kind of like just fall into place. And I look up and I'm like, I don't even know how, how we got here, but because of God, you know, because I just trusted in him and didn't try to, like, think and plan and, you know, do everything. Not that we shouldn't, you know, prepare and things like that, but 
do all that, but don't forget to consult with Jesus first. So uh, that made me think of First Timothy six seventeen. Mm -hmm. Paul says to Timothy, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us, giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Um, talk about limiting uh, or, or getting in your own way of, of releasing mm -hmm. potential to trusting in uncertain riches yeah. instead of trusting in God, there's so many times, you know, that, like a decision made because of fear is mm -hmm. a decision made because of the uncertain riches. Mm -hmm. God, you know, God is leading you to do something, but we go or yeah, not like, do I don't want to give up this but income because of or the, something the money, like that. Mm -hmm. Which is nothing inherently yeah. wrong with money, but if it's in what you trust in instead of trusting in God, and how do you know that if it's driving your decision making? Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, very, very much true. Sure. And it, so apparently that's not just a uh, uh, a temptation of the poor. No. Because he addresses it to the, the rich. Charge them, that's us, mm -hmm. by the way, mm -hmm. in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, that makes that makes me think of when he did come across the rich man and he's like, you know, what do I got to do to be saved? And he was telling them the... Um, and they'll love your neighbor more than yourself and all that. And he's like, yeah, I'm already doing all that. Like, I give, tip for it, whatever. And he's like, okay, well, take up your cross and follow me. Like, give all your stuff away and come follow me. And he's like, yeah, walks away fast. Because he can't get out of his own way. He's built this fortress up. And he's put all his trust in these things and cannot, you know, release them to follow Christ. So, yeah. Um, every member a minister. I love this because, um, again, like not looking at people on the outer and kind of sizing them up and saying, okay, well, the body of Christ could use you. I mean, you could help, but you know what I mean? Like, and I've seen leaders do that where they will lead someone, you know, just a lay them, uh, like a, what we call them, oh, bench warmers, you know, mm -hmm. and they won't even, you know, push those people to move forward or get up or just engage whatever it may be in any form or type of serving. They just let them be, you know, comfortable bench warmers. But, you know, every member of minister, every member of minister it kind of reminds me that whether you see somebody just sitting there or you see somebody, you know, fully seeking out something to do in the body, you know, look past what you see. Because even the person that's just trying to be so active and upfront and do all this stuff, might be the person that needs a little bit more, you know, some things in, in the background they need to take care of. So, and then the one that's sitting there warming that bench, you, they might, they probably hold some powerful stuff that you need to pull out of them, you know, so as a leader. So I just, I really like this thought. Um, everyone has been given gifts, talents, skills, and anointings. A good leader will help others to discover their usefulness to the kingdom of God and how they can also contribute within the local church. Um, leaders recognize the value in others and will invest time developing and individual regardless of the risk. And then I just put growth steps in shape because growth steps is something that um, Church on the Rock offers. And uh, my husband and I did that and it, it was really good. We've done stuff like this in the past, like, um, at our previous church and stuff like that, but um, but it was, and it was good for that time, like, you know, I feel like even when we did Growth Steps recently, some of the stuff that, you know, or what I want to say, like, it, things changed, like, where I'm at now to where I was, you know, five years ago when I did it or whatever, which, it changed, and God has developed some other areas now. And I'm like, oh, okay, I see, I see, you know? But um, those, all those things kind of help you figure out, like, okay, what kind of, you know, where you would thrive, you know, at and things like that. And then shape um, in our small group, um, one of the people that come in our small group actually introduced this whole, like, shape concept to us. And it's kind of like the same thing in girl sex where you just kind of, like, you know, you write down, answer questions about, like, your passions and... You know, different things like that. And it kind of helps steer you in the right direction. 
Um, but with shape, I feel like I prayed more about it and asked that because there were questions that I couldn't answer. You know, and I'm like, I don't know what what that I don't know what I like or what what I would really want or something like whatever it was. I'm like, okay, God, I need you to answer this question for me. So even though we do these things, um, they do kind of help us kind of channel in a certain direction. But it's good to just pray. Um, whether if you go through growth steps or do something like a shape or a personality test or whatever, just pray and ask God to show you, you know, where you would be fit at. And if you're going through it with other believers, as we were in our small group, like we were just like, you know, talking with one another and we were able to kind of encourage somebody else, like somebody else in the group was like, I don't know about this or that. And I'm like, yeah, I totally could see that in you. Like you totally da 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 like all the time. So, I mean, again, just recognizing that in other people and yourself as well. And that's all I got. Thanks, Shirley. Extra recess. Not if anybody has questions. <laughs> Any questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> you know, was the um the Samaritan woman is she the woman that Jesus talked about um, that helped with the spies? No, you're thinking of a uh, Rahab. Oh. Yeah, Rahab was a prostitute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, like, who, the, who were the spies? Why did they call them spies? What are you talking about? And oh. the, with the story of Rahab? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know. I think they were just, they didn't, they were did chasing, they name them? They went to go they look at the land. Yeah, they didn't name, they like, the they didn't name the spies. Yeah, I'm like, should they name them? No. They were doing a reconnaissance before the attack. They were getting ready to attack. And they check it out. And she helped them out. Um, so thinking about, you said something I think is really true, is that in church, uh, leaders will often uh, uh, harness the people that are that are self uh, motivating, yeah, right, and get a lot of work out of them. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but to the neglect of people who are not who need a, the more cultivation in order to bring their gifts into into play. So you know, there's a, a very familiar phrase in church: eighty twenty. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And you know, so it holds uh, I think it's called the Pareto principle, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure, but uh, the uh, so well, I think uh, there's something as leaders to to, to really face, and uh, and I mentioned there's a balance to this, but but you have a situation of uh, you're trying to get something done. So it's really easy. It's the path of least resistance to just take the people who are, you know, the, the, ready to the go. best, uh, ready yeah. to go, whatever. But actually, the great commission is discipleship, mm -hmm. right? And so, so when we see somebody who's, you know, not fulfilling their potential, if our heart and our motivation is for discipleship, mm -hmm. then we're gonna go after that. But not that they'll be tough, but they'll never be as as good as, you know, <coughs> Bill and Susie over here. That's not actually our our mission. Mm -hmm. Although it's easy in church culture, modern church culture, to make it a mission, right? Because they yeah. can make you look good or make your job easier or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but the mission that Jesus gave us is discipleship. So that's for everybody. And like you said, mm -hmm. John and Susie Q over here, they may have some character issues, you know, to work on even though they're extremely good at the moment, yeah. whatever. Um, the balancing on that is that as leaders, um, we have to be good stewards of our of our efforts. And so if, if somebody is not productive, right, if they're not mm -hmm. faithful and we try, you know, like the Jesus told the parable about the the uh, husbandman who uh, there's a fig tree that's not producing. Mm -hmm. And the master says, uh, you know, the fig tree's not doing anything for us. Uh, cut it down. He says, well, let me let me dig around it and, and fertilize it and see if I can get it to go. And then next year, if it's if it's not producing anything, then I'll cut it down. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, you have to just say, okay, well, that's not happening. That's not a good stewardship of, of my time and effort. But 
as leaders, we should, if we're driven by the mission of discipleship mm -hmm. and a uh, recognition that everybody in the body of Christ is somebody that, that Jesus blood, Jesus died to redeem them mm -hmm. and bring them to the family and into the church, then we can not fall to the temptation right. of just getting, uh, like, cultivating the people who are going to, you know, make my job go well. Hey, there's people like that. We all know who they are. You know, people like that. <laughs> so, um, in the church, you know, they're full of uh, gifting, full of energy, willing to, to serve and work, and that's nothing wrong with that. But as leaders, we have to have a Jesus commission yeah. that we're moved by. So, mm -hmm. that's an excellent job. All right. Nobody else? Anybody else? Krista? <laughs> Just teasing. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Brief intermission. No. You guys need a break. Denise gets it done. Okay. That was. Great. I can learn from that. <laughs> my other, my other.